Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Coalition Greenwich webinar. Hope everybody can hear me well, connection is working. Um, I'm Paulina Hensley, Head of Biocide Relations at Coalition Greenwich, and would like to thank you all for attending today's presentation and discussion on the electronification of the credit markets. We are very excited that today's webinar is the first by the Coalition Greenwich family and brings together in a new and unique way powerful insight from both entities, Coalition's flagship competitor analytics and Greenwich insight on market structure and technology. The agenda is a short presentation by Coalition Greenwich to set the scene, looking at the recent evolution of banking revenues in credit and at pertinent electronification trends and potential future outlook. Following that, there will be a 30-minute panel where our guests will discuss a variety of the most critical aspects in this area. We invite all of our listeners to submit the questions at the forefront of their minds during both of these segments. You can do so in the questions window in the right-hand side of your screens. And finally, we'll conclude with a 10 or 15-minute Q&A session where our panelists will address those questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce today's participants. The opening presentation will be given by my colleague Molly Devine, Head of Fixed Income uh, and Commodities Research for College in Greenwich. The moderator of the session will be another colleague of mine, Kevin McPartland, Head of Market Structure and Technology for College in Greenwich. And finally, our esteemed panelists are Eric Morrow, Head of Business Development Credit Trading at JP Morgan Chase. Phil Seichler, Institutional Sales and Trading Fixed Income Specialist at Jane Street. Tom Melvin, Senior High Yield Trader at Invesco, joined by Molly Devine. So on behalf of Coalition Greenwich, thank you again for participation in today's event. Uh, well, with that, I'll pass it over to Molly to kick us off. Thanks, Paulina and a good morning to everyone on the call today. We wanted to start our session today by providing context on the overall flow credit landscape over the last few years and highlight some of the key trends that we've seen evolve in electronic trading. We can start off on page three of the presentation. Here we have two charts which show the total G10 flow credit revenue opportunity across the largest global banks. These revenue pools are split by product on the left-hand side of the page and by region on the right. As you can see here, 2020 was a very strong year for flow credit trading globally, where annual revenues almost doubled year on year. We saw substantial volumes, bank-specific one-off hedging gains, and the increasing importance of e-activity amidst the first quarter liquidity challenges. While 2021 was also a relatively strong performance from a historical perspective, there was significant year-on-year -year normalization from outsized gains in 2020. IG revenues fell by almost half that year, and the US market was particularly impacted. Finally, the first half of this year has been quite challenged in flow credit, with global revenues down approximately 36% year on year. Um, this has largely come from low issuance, from widening spreads, and also macro uncertainty, which have all contributed significantly to the year on year downtick. In summary, we see bank revenues and flow credit trending broadly lower post 2020. From our perspective, the market outlook is unlikely to improve in the near term until risk appetite returns and we see greater clarity on the medium term rate environment. Let's move on to the following page, please. So here we notice that despite the volatile revenue environment we've seen over the past few years in flow credit, E-trading as a percentage of cash volume has been steadily growing. In the US, which we're showing on this slide, the share of E in both investment grade and high yield has roughly doubled over this period, 
settling above 40% in investment grade and north of 30% in high yield. We've highlighted March 2020 on the slide, which serves as an interesting example um, of how E-Trading behaved in the dislocation following the COVID era shutdown. Here we see a small dip in March 2020 in E-Trading on a relative basis. However, this figure is a bit misleading as March 2020 actually recorded the highest absolute E-volumes up until that point. From this, we can conclude that even in periods of extreme market volatility, E-Trading remained a viable execution strategy for both banks and institutional investors alike. Will, can we flip on to the following page here, please? So on page five, um, we highlight that within the E-Trading space, we've seen particular focus on portfolio, algo, and ETF trading from the sell side. The chart on the left shows the increasing prevalence of credit ETF trading, which in turn has supported growth in both algo and portfolio trading capabilities. From our perspective, banks and market makers have invested in platforms and quants largely for two reasons. The first is to respond to their largest institutional investors demand for better liquidity with less information leakage. And secondly, portfolio trading has allowed banks to turn over their inventory more quickly, thereby improving revenue productivity off the same amount of inventory for their respective businesses. From a competitive perspective, generally we've seen that the firms who invested earliest in technology have generated the lion's share of revenues over the past few years. We do see portfolio and algo trading revenues heavily concentrated amongst a handful of banks and market makers. While some <coughs> banks started their PT efforts as early as 2016, others have only done their first portfolio trade this year. For newcomers who missed the revenue boom in 2020, portfolio trading prob profitability has been extremely challenging due to increased competition and reduced client activity. In the first half of this year, most banks have actually lost money in portfolio trading, with some rethinking their approach to this business more broadly in light of the required investment to meaningfully compete. Will, can we flip on to page six, please? Given the dynamics we've discussed, the critical question remains, what does the future look like for electronification and credit? If we take FX and equities as an example, we would expect three trends to emerge over the coming years. First is that the percentage of E-trading within flow credit will very likely move higher, perhaps to levels even seen in other asset classes on the left-hand side of the chart on page six. Secondly, sell-side margins will likely be compressed over time as electronic trading displaces voice trading and is increasingly commodified across the street. Finally, we see that other credit products which are less liquid are likely to progress along a similar path to flow credit. As an example, we've already seen market evolution for electronic trading in loans, municipals, CLOs, and total return swaps. And we expect those trends to continue onwards into the future. In summary, we've seen a lot of exciting electronic innovation and flow credit over the last few years. And at this point, I'd love to hand over to Kevin and our amazing panelists today to discuss these trends in more detail. Kevin. Great, Molly. Thanks so much. Thanks for the introduction and lead in. It really tells an amazing story um, of what the sort of markets in general and the credit markets in particular have seen from an innovation and e-trading perspective over the last couple of years. So yeah, I'm really excited to have Tom, Eric, and Phil to talk this through. Obviously, three very uh, informed folks from three very informed organizations. Um, so I mean, if, if we can start uh, with a macro question. So the big push really that we've seen um, in automation in the credit market was re really was catalyzed right around March 2020, right? We were already on a growth trend, but that really just pushed us along even further and the data really shows that. Um, but that said, this automation happened while there were 
at least two big market shocks. I guess we can argue how many shocks there really were over the last two and a half years. But it's certainly been in a time of uh, stress and volatility for the most part. Um, so where are we now, right? Mark can continue to be volatile. Um, there's multi percentage point moves, you know, it seems like every day, um, depending on the asset class. Um, so yeah, where are we as the new market structure that's developed over the last few years working? Um, I don't know, Tom, if it's all right, like we'll start from the investor perspective. Maybe you can start us off. Sure. Um, well, I think if you weren't, uh, if you weren't well versed in electronic trading before March of 2020, you quickly came up the curve, right? As everyone exited their their the comfort of their office and and went home and started trading electronically, um, if you had resisted that functionality to that point, you quickly learned that it was the easiest way to get things done, as as massive flows were coming through, uh, you know all the fixed income asset classes. So where I think we're at now is a more educated group of buy side traders, um, very well honed sell side shops with uh, algorithmic trading, um, cash traders, uh, squaring positions through the electronic market. Um, and I think I, I have a tendency to believe it's just going to continue. Uh, I, I think we see numbers even rise from here as deals get larger, right? I mean, it used to be a $500 million deal in high yield was decent size. Now, if it's not a billion, it's not considered liquid. So as we continue to see new issues get priced uh, in a large format, for lack of a better term, um, we're going to see that liquidity increase, which should help the case of electronic trading. And, and Tom, from your see as an investor and i know this is a subjective question but are things better today in terms of getting orders done in terms of finding the liquidity you need than they were in 2018 19. uh i think so yeah i have a tendency to believe that's the case i mean um you're always going to have your uh, kind of niche bonds that are going to need to be done by voice no matter if it's 50k bonds or you know five and a half million if you're going to trade it there's always going to be deals like that that are just um just not very liquid because of, of whether it's insurance companies holding or just the pure size of the deal but I, I definitely think and also the uh the direct connectivity of all to all markets and things like that um you know and and, and the systems as well has helped increase liquidity right i mean um direct feeds, dealer inventories, you know, that's that's the goal to, to get investors to um, be able to do that almost in in a one one step kind of process. And um, I think that's improving and I think we're going to see it improve even more as we see EMSs come to the buy side um, as, as we get as we get access to multiple platforms without needing 27 screens up on our or 27 yeah. a, 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 more than a handful of platforms up on our screens so i think yeah. that's even going to increase fair enough it's because of all the good liquidity phil and eric have been providing you right 100 percent, 100 percent. um so eric that's probably your your cue right sitting sort of you know from the major dealer side like what does the last two three years look like and where are we today uh, yeah, sure. And, and thanks, uh, Kevin Molly and Pauline for having me. Um, so look, I, there's two things I thought about with this question. Um, one, the increase in volatility has naturally tested uh, not only the, the sell sides tech stack, but also the buy side and being able to digest, you know, RFQ lists of 500 items or more or portfolio trades of 1500 line items or more. Uh, they've really tested our abilities to process and provide liquidity. And so that's been a really positive outcome in that, like, we built, you know, uh, much more scale. And I think those who have had this, you know, multi-asset and to Tom's point, multi-protocol approach, you can't just use, you know, list trading or all to all or or portfolio trading for everything. You have to be knowledgeable in all the, all the new protocols. Um, so that was one. Uh, the other thing I think that we've, we've noticed is, um, as volatility goes up, there's an actual desire to turn over risk quicker. Uh, and that's, you know, really to make sure we can provide better liquidity to clients. So coming up with smarter, faster ways to turn over risk as we do a big portfolio trader, as we take down a list, uh, that's an area that I know a lot of my peers are investing in. I think that will, you know, the one who can do that the best will be the one who will survive the next you know, three to five years. 
So, so Eric, is that generally the approach, right? You need to listen to your clients, understand how they want to interact, and then make sure you provide the protocols, the tools, the way of interacting that, right, that, that they're looking for. Right, yeah, and, and we'll cover more on the direct connectivity for sure, but we provide liquidity on, you know, as many avenues as you could think of, right? All different ways, every protocol. Um, how do we make it most efficient for the buy side to inter interact with us? That's really our goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, and Phil, I mean, Jane Street's growth in fixed income in a lot of ways has tracked the growth of electronic trading overall. So, I mean, what's the last few years look like for you and the firm as you've uh, as you've grown that business? Yeah, um, yeah, Kevin, it's a really good question, and and I think the best way to kind of view it is we've grown and and looked at technology. Uh, and the fixed income market as the fixed income ETF market has really grown, right? When when I joined Jane Street and the beginning of 2009, fixed income ETFs were 30 billion uh, AUM, right? And we're, we're talking the US is now over a trillion and globally, I mean, maybe one, two and globally we're at one, five. Um, I, I was a former credit trader, right? And I understood a lot of the um, kind of the workflows and problems as a liquidity taker, right? And how do you aggregate data and to Tom's point, how do you think about dealer inventory? Uh, and, and I was fascinated by, by the RFQ protocol because you would look at who had inventory or who was, um, you know, alleging they were axed or, or was natural and you'd send out an RFQ and you'd have three responses from people who were not advertising a security. And I think a lot of those conversations took place before uh, some of the EMS venues were out there or the other data aggregators. And the ETF market went from, say, a product like LQD, which was 100 bonds in IG um, back in 09, to well over you know, 2,000 securities now. So the ability to leverage technology, like Eric said, like what, is a, what does a client need? What does a trading desk need? And what's the intersection of, that, um, of those technologies? And to Eric's point, uh, with volatility, has really, you know, what's kind of come up with the growth of fixed income ETFs is the velocity of trading has increased, right? And, and that has put more demands on liquidity providers to meet the demands of liquidity takers. So we've seen massive growth um, from certain channels of the asset manager community. We've seen uh, asset owners start to embrace technology in ways that they had not um, 10 years ago for navigating investment decisions as well as the implementation of those trade ideas. Um, so we've really grown with the ETF market. Um, you know, we're, uh, we are very comfortable with RFQ-based protocols. We think about you know, the feedback loop that's inherent in, in an RFQ, um, but we're, you know, we're very cognizant and listening to what our clients' needs um, as their businesses move forward. Um, with you know more challenging rate as well as credit environments. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get back to ETFs in a minute. But I, I, you said about the velocity of trading increasing, which generally feels like it's a good thing. Although if we think back 20 years when that really happened in equities, right, there was some negative connotations there. Our research suggests that's not what the buy side thinks about credit, right, as things get more automated. But what's been your experience there? Is the velocity increase a good thing? The velocity increase seems to be a good thing. I mean, it's a it's a it's a very nice feedback loop. And to your comment, you know, if if velocity was um, was a problem 25 years ago, you know, I think there was things not available in the market. Right, trace reporting was was not available. Right, so post trade uh, transparency in the U.S. is is a vital um, part of the feedback loop. In Europe, you know, pre trade transparency is a lot more developed than it is here per se. Um, there's just a vast number of QCIPs in the credit market, right? So um, when you talk about velocity of trading in equities, um, Apple has one has one ticker it trades under, right? But if you go to Apple's uh, corporate bond structure, it's all investment grade, but there's lots of bonds. You start to take high yield into account to Tom's world, you're gonna have senior subs. So some bonds will trade, electronically more so than other bonds. Uh, so in credit, the velocity um, adds a different element because there's so many QCIPs. Uh, mm -hmm. That also allows different liquidity providers to offer clients optionality around substitutes. Um, you know, a particular bond might not be available, but another one might, that fit might, you know, be well placed within a client's portfolio. 
That's fair. And I guess, right, I mean, really, we talk about U.S. corporate bonds as one market, but really, right, there are several markets in there that operate in different ways, depending on the um, the characteristics of each security. Yep. Yeah, that's very um, true. So yeah, I think to, sorry, Kevin, I think to Phil's point uh, in terms of velocity, um, I always used to like in high yield trading 20, 25 years ago to where loans were 10 years ago. Right. So if we see velocity pick up in loans, as Phil mentioned, with that lack of transparency, trace reporting, if we see if we see volumes continue to pick up in the loan market, um, which is not something that I currently trade, but I have in the past, uh, I think that can only be beneficial for what I would consider the more liquid IG EM high yield space. Right. I mean, if if loans can get flowing, then the rest of the more kind of transparent asset classes and fixed income should also be able to follow along, I think, at a, at a, at a heavier increase. Well, well and, and the loan market, right, is going through a bit of a test right now. Um, and often, right, we've seen innovation come out of, you know, tough markets um, in, in certain fixed income products. So maybe that will bring some innovation in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I would expect that somebody smart like Phil to figure out how to settle loans <laughs> on a timely basis. But... Maybe he missed the calling. A lot of credit there, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, Eric, I'm going to I'm going to change tack slightly. Um, there was a lot of things we just covered in there that we'll get back to in a minute. But I wanted to talk about sort of relationships as the markets electronify. Clearly, relationships don't matter. Um, you know, we've been we've been looking at and writing about electron trading for years and years and years. But always, it comes back to there's still a relationship component, right? Even if it's now you need to have a relationship with the algo developer, there's still a trust and relationship component there. So, you know, how do you how do you maintain that? How is that developing in credit markets as they have electronified over the last few years? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, you know, one of the things we've noticed is when we go to client meetings, you're meeting not only with the high touch, but the low touch teams, you're meeting with the, the quant team. So, right, there's a lot more systematic pods or systematic arms if even asset managers that we're meeting with so those those are not cropping up we spend a lot more time on education to some of the newer entrants in the market uh so that's been a big change we've noticed um the other thing is you know clients are pushing for more data uh they want more and it's not just more access they want more color and you know we we definitely hear the buy side that is a problem for the sell side to figure how do we do that in scale and consistency um but the thing that we tell clients is, look, if you want to partner with JP Morgan on an electronic trading perspective, connect directly. And we have many different ways in which we offer that connectivity. <clears throat> and so, Tom, what's that from your perspective? Direct connectivity has been a hot one for the last, I don't know, the better part of the last two years. Um, is that something Invesco has dabbled with? Is that something you're interested in? Uh, definitely interested. Definitely have dabbled. Um, we have... Um, multiple dealer inventories that come directly to our uh, to our OMS, and um, you know the functionality within that is still I think not optimal in terms of um, if you were to uh, like to have a discussion on the levels that are indicated. Um, so I think it's a little difficult. In my opinion, the the race for the buy side is to find the place to get the most, I'm sorry, the, the sell side to find the place that the buy side has the most eyes so that they could get that inventory there. I don't think it's a concern as to which platform it may be, but as soon as the sell side figures out where the most buy side are, eyes are, that's gonna be the platform that kind of wins that race, right? I mean, it can, it can lead to so many iterations of direct, trading between buy side accounts uh, much like we see in the all to all platforms uh, and and just the ease of the dealer inventory it's just i think right now the entire market struggles with which space has that best information and has the most dealer access in one location and i think it's just i mean obviously a lot of smart people here as i mentioned it will get figured out. It's just a matter of where that's going to happen over the next, you know, six year, six months to year, um, maybe, maybe a little longer. Right. Well, there's a there's a push and pull, right, where you want 
as, a, as an end user, and even as a dealer, you want everything in one place because that's easier. But then on the other hand, competition amongst the venues and fintech um, is good, right? Because it drives innovation, it keeps prices down, right? So it's hard to, uh, we're gonna, I think we're gonna be dealing with that probably in perpetuity. Yeah, and, and, and as I mentioned before, and I, I don't mean to hang on this point, but uh, I think buy side operating systems have to get better. Um, you know, whether it's an EMS, uh, it's, you know, it, it's just real estate and, and it's figuring out who to commit your real estate space to, um, without potentially missing anything. So, uh, especially in times of trying markets. Yeah. Phil, Phil, you're giving some good nods there. What do you, what do you think on this? Oh, the, Tom, Tom's brought up a lot of very valid points, stuff that we've thought about over the years, you know, um, there, there's not, um, you know, the fixed income market structure, right? You, there's multiple aspects of fixed income, right? You can talk about credit, you can talk about mortgages, you can talk about rates. Uh, within credit, you have IG, high yield, EM, uh, and, and then you can talk about your your AT1s, your COCOs, right? There's a lot of complexity in the credit market. Um, and then you think about uh, large institutions um, that might have multi-asset trading desks sitting um, within you know within one area, so they'll be trading all of those products. So to synthesize all of those um, particular nuances for each asset class are, are challenging. Um, so to Tom's point, at the buy side, um, there's not a one size fits all approach. Um, an asset manager's needs might be entirely different than a, a investment manager that's sitting on top of a, a you know, large general account, a large insurance company. Um, so, you know, figuring out the balance between leveraging technology as well as what Eric, you know, uh, was talking about earlier about maintaining client relationships is, is important, right? At a firm like Jane Street, where we grew up with equity DNA, right? If there's a particular market structure that exists, there's the reg NMS and quote protection, and lit order books, as well as there's dark order books. Um, there's RFQ protocols that exist in the equity world as much as you know, using low touch technology to access um, liquidity, whether it's from a competitor or say another another buy side firm in the market. And, and that's what makes uh, this, uh, you know, this journey uh, challenging, but exciting, right? Because you get to hear the viewpoints of what a client may have asked their top five liquidity providers um, to work on. And then there's a whole other set of uh, institutions that may not be able to embrace um, those workflows and you need to find the happy medium uh, between all of it. Um, so we're in an interesting spot because we're, um, we don't have the same sales bandwidth that a lot of our larger uh, bank competitors um, offer to their institutional clients. And in fixed income, we have you know, less than half a dozen folks in the States talking to you know, north of you know, 400 institutional clients who are coming to us for liquidity. So we rely on electronic trading um, protocols, particularly RFQs, uh, and then we add a, you know, a high touch element on the back end of it for <clears throat> things like portfolio trading around uh, <coughs> solutions based workflows for a client that might have a large inflow, large outflow, or, you know, kind of a, a, an asset allocation realignment. Uh, and that goes into play with kind of how we think about the ETF world and all of that sitting in, in one uh, one central risk book um, to provide clients with an easy means of accessing uh, you know our capital provision. You, you, you raise a lot of good points, but you raise one really good point that stuck with me, right? Is there is it's a reminder there's so much uh, good, new, interesting, innovative technology out there um, for fixed income markets, every pre-trade, post-trade, you know, at trade. Um, just analytics, reporting, automation, um, but you know, on the other hand, it almost seems like um, it provides you know, both the buy side and the sell side. I think probably it paralyzed a bit because there's just only so many hours in the day to try new things. You have to go with what you know works or what you're used to. Eric, I know you and I have talked a lot about just all of these interesting new ideas over the years, and I suspect a lot of it crosses your desk, and you have to decide where to spend time and not. So what is that process like? And then do you work with your clients to help them sift through all the great new technology as well? Yeah, no, I, it, it, is, it is a full-time job to just sift through and, and listen to pitches. And there's a lot of interesting stuff out there for sure. Um, 
Well, look, we're, we're, we've been very transparent in how we provide liquidity. We provide it across, there's actually a picture of a map that we should be directly with clients. And uh, look, we, as I mentioned before, the best way to partner with us is to connect directly. We, we have to provide liquidity to many of the multi platforms and EMSs and OMSs. Um, one of the things I think we, the industry needs, um, and we've been chatting a lot about this, Kevin, but uh, like having a standardized way to approach these protocols and data and uh, why are there 50 ways to send an RFQ? Why, why does the buy side have to figure out how to, how to manage various connections to do that? Um, and so I think if we could bring if we could bring standardization to that to the marketplace, uh, it will alleviate a lot of the friction that we currently have in the market. Um, I mean, to hear what Tom thinks about that, but like the, the as we get talk about more about the growth of direct connectivity, I think one of the the inhibitors in that is the fact that it is quite challenging to you know how do you, why are there ten ways to send an RFQ, and every platform has a new way and they tweak it, and the fragmentation is great. But it also creates a lot of problems, and it, it reduces the amount of electronification that we can actually get done. Yeah, I I totally agree with your point. It can be it can be frustrating at times. It's 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 a difficult task for me and our team just to figure out which platforms we should be looking at, right? In terms of newer innovations and and who's improving on what's already uh, existing. And what we have to remember is. At buy side traders are very regimented, you know, as innovative as they may be, you know, market access was not an overnight success, right? You know, in 2006, 2005, they were asking us to trade, you know, just anything under 500 bonds on a system. And, you know, that was their pitch. And now we've seen that growth exponentially to uh, the numbers that, that that Molly showed earlier, and and I know it's not just their numbers, but obviously they're um, one of the catalysts. So it's uh, it's difficult. Uh, it, it's difficult for time allotment. It's um, but I think as the partnership works between our counterparties and the respective buy side shops, um, that's how I think we can kind of get over that hump is by not just five guys from Invesco, five people from Invesco sitting around saying, oh, I really like this, I really like that. We need to make sure that our counterparties are um, comfortable with systems and making sure that we're on the same page because it's not the platform that's important. It's the relationship with the counterparty that's important, right? So it can be great for Invesco, but if we call our <coughs> 10, 10 counterparties and they say, uh, we saw this and, and and didn't like it. It doesn't quite fit with what we're trying to achieve. We can't ask for better feedback than that. And I I personally think our our we have been remiss in in doing that. So um, you bring up a you know your your point that the clients got to like it. You guys got to be on board. We need to make sure that that you that that our counterparties are the our first or second point of contact after we see something. Yeah, and fixed income people hate equities comparisons, right? But, you know, equities figured out how to, you know, they came up with the fixed protocol um, in the late 90s, right? I think before Google even existed, right? And that so that was 20 something years ago. Uh, I'm sure there is a more efficient way, right, to put standards in place today um, that should be easier to implement than it was then. Um, well, they so. had to get away from fractions because, you know, they were having a tough time breaking them down, so they had to go to pennies. <laughs> we'll cover that on the next webinar. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so one, one more one more point on the relationship bit, and then we'll get into some sort of some more ETF talk. Um, but so I think one of the benefits of all these protocol choices is right giving clients what they need when they need it. So specifically in times of market volatility, we've had a lot of them lately. The data has suggested over the last two years that e-trading, if, if anything, e-trading tends to grow. It also looks like the use of credit ETFs tend to grow when markets get volatile. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that works? I guess for Eric and Phil, from you know, from working with clients, is there more voice? Do they pick up the phone more? They, like, what does that look like on the ground? I mean, we see the data, but what does it look like on the ground? And then after that, you know, Tom, from your perspective, like, how do you interact with your counterparty on tough days? Um, I don't know, Phil. Why don't we start with you? Sure. So, you know, I, I think there's going to be 
some similarities and some differences between what, what Eric and I have to say here, right? Because I think we have slightly different business models. Um, you know, we're we're not a destination for a client who's looking to, you know, sell 50 million or buy 50 million of a single QCIP, right? And, and I think that that's um, a value proposition that just doesn't fit Jane Street's business model, right? Um, so when volatility picks up, we we do see um, electronic flows just um, uptick, right? And, and large asset managers are beholden to you know client activity. Right? I used to work at a credit hedge fund, and if you had you know a redemption, you had to put that you know you had to go and to to work in the market. Um, so when when the vol picks up, uh, we see ETFs uh, and electronic RFQ list pick up uh, portfolio trading. Uh, but the ETF has really led the charge. There's a lot of price information available on the exchange. You know, I've talked about this for 10 years, uh, and, but the products have grown, right? The AUM is there, uh, and it's allowed for dealers to think about their inventory in a different capacity than they historically have. Um, but clients also now have a much greater sense of where are they going to move a large um sleeve of risk right what you know whether you want to call that index risk or beta risk um so we will we will hear more phone calls you know client is uh thinking about putting cash to work and maybe the etf market is trading a little bit soft well that could be a great a great place for them to engage their top liquidity providers for a portfolio trade um or just go out on on a platform and OWIC um a bunch of securities that they're they're looking for and that's where the providers will look to um, to provide the offset at Jane Street, really our business model is providing to to client flows and um, trying to mitigate impact going through the market. So if ETFs are for sale, you know we're going to be better sellers of, of PT risk or or providing on electronic OICs going on the RFQ venues. Um, but we've seen clients start to um, institutionalize within their organizations the ability to be more reactive to to market moves. Um, you know, whether they're looking at um, HYG, JNK, or another product out there at high yield, um, and then thinking about how does that correlate with CDX. Um, so there's a lot more information, uh, which adds complexity, but the tools that the traders have with working with their portfolio managers, right? Tom's job is not in isolation, in a vacuum, where he's only focused on the stuff on his pad. He's talking to the high yield PMs. He's talking to the IG PMs. They're talking about what are they trying to get done? How are their their targets moving as, as the market is repricing, whether it's rate movement, credit spreads, um, you know, S&Ps down a percent and a half. How does that impact high yield? Um, so you get more conversations around that on our end, whereas we're going to get less so, hey, how are how are these off the run bonds moving? You know, where are they going to trade today if I have a, a block to, to buy or sell? Um, that's just not a place we're navigating in. Right. And just that's exactly where I would pick up is, you know, like historically and, and to this day, like, you know, providing market context to clients is an invaluable tool that we will continue to do. Uh, but to Phil's point, a lot of things around, you know, um, being able to, you know, be more aggressive on and being a, a larger presence on the ETF market are clearly areas where everyone kind of needs to be better at. Um, and so we kind of have a two prong approach. One is we do have that traditional high touch business, but on the low touch side, um, being able to respond to, you know, bigger lists, bigger sizes, being faster at moving risk. Uh, these are areas that, you know, we've gotten a lot better at in the last you know, couple of years and we expect to get much better in the future. And, the, you know, I said earlier on, you know, having a scalable approach to using multiple protocols, you know, we tell that to clients and in return, we have to provide that liquidity on all the various protocols so that they're, leaving IOIs or sending our queues or wanting to build a portfolio. Uh, and again, that may change depending on, on the volatility of the market in that given day, but we have to be there for our clients and all those different things. Yeah, and, and I think Eric hit on, a, on an important point with um, kind of the uh, what's going on on the desk, right? And I know this may not be the optimal comment on an electronic trading webinar, but there's nothing better than hearing from a salesperson that, hey, we have buyers of double beat paper at eight and a half percent inside of five years. 
We are sellers of obviously longer duration with rate volatility and things like that. And, and that should help buy side traders um, kind of get bigger things done in, in quicker fashion, right? I would say that you don't, you don't get as many of those calls as, as we did five, seven, 10 years ago um, because communication has become electronic. But I, I think the most valuable information buy side traders can get is just the general theme of what desks are trying to accomplish. Not specific axes, you know, we can, we can all find a bid on charter 31s. However, if, you know, there are certain, you know, insurance companies are moving money, you have an idea of what insurance company risk looks like. If that ax happens to come across my blotter, then I know where to go. It's not always, you can't see that in QMGR on Bloomberg. You can only see, you can only find that information through the communication and you know, whether it's the working from home aspect and more electronic communication just by IB or or combing axes, it's, it's at least for me, it's difficult to comb axes and see a theme, right? I, I need that information to come from, from individuals who cover us and give us the broader picture of, of, of what's going on as, as a broader desk, not just the autos guy, but the TMT <coughs> guy and, um, those themes I find um, to be pretty important. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think I think it's. I'm glad you know the relationship uh, point, um, right? I brought it up as well. It's interesting to hear hear it, you know, right from the ground. There, um, still important. You need the electronic liquidity, the pre-trade transparency, but um, having somebody to call when times get stressed um, is also pretty important. Um, as, if anybody in the audience has any questions, um, we're going to keep going, but, but please sort of enter them into the, uh, into the platform box. We'll keep an eye on those. We'll try to get one or two in uh, before the top of the hour if we, if we can. Um, so so we, we haven't, we've talked a lot about ETFs. I'm not sure if there's more there, um, but I think one of the, uh, I guess you would call it, effects of the ET, growth of ETFs is portfolio trading has also grown. Um, it felt like a very, very hot topic probably last year. Um, certainly is still a big part of the market. Depends on the month, right? But probably five, six percent of trades volume is portfolio trading. Um, is it is it underhyped, overhyped? Like where do we see portfolio trading going? Is it just gonna be one more tool in the toolbox for the buy side? Um, yeah, curious your your thoughts on on what's next there. Um, I guess I'll open it up. Any of you I'm sure could answer. Uh, I'll, I'll let Phil start. I'll start. I mean, <laughs> we're seeing more and more clients use it. Um, I think it's a function of the the type of trade and the type of investment that needs to that needs to happen, right? So some clients like the all and you know all or none nature. Um, so you know the speed of execution. If you're working at a trading desk where you're the PM trader and Analyst all wrapped up in, in one role. Um, but in, in large volume asset managers, it's become a very important tool for uh, deploying or, or um, letting cash go, right? Uh, but I think, Kevin, to your point, it is a, a tool, right? It is, it is something to think about versus list trading, versus ETF, versus TRS, um, you know, futures contracts. It, it, the the trading desk and the portfolio management team on the buy side, um, you know, they need to make that decision. What's the right protocol? And, and, you know, Jane Street, it's been a great tool for accessing, you know, more clients. Um, but at the same time, we're, you know, it is not the only way to go about executing, you know, risk transfer across you know, lots of securities. Sometimes it's the best way and sometimes it's better to send a list RFQ. Um, I think that's where data analytics play a very big part in um, in the equation here and, and to Tom's earlier comments, but I think that's where um, the bifurcation in, you know, the quality of platforms that are being used internally for the buy side um, kind of puts some folks at the forefront at, at being able to decide quickly which is the way to, to go um, versus others who who may not really know what's the best way to do it. Um, but it's been a fascinating thing and I think really important, you know, during 2020 when 
you know, March came, uh, we, we saw a little bit of a delay in folks using it. Um, and then we saw an uptick in people using it to, to sell risk. And then all of a sudden, you know, a bunch of people realized when the risk on market came, the quickest way to actually get your deltas or your exposure on was either through portfolio trading or ETFs, because a lot of this single security trading, the markets were just moving too quickly. Um, and that, that velocity and that, that gappy price action, that's where something like a portfolio trade could actually be the, the, must, the, the more efficient means um, for deploying your, your trade. Uh, I would just say, to further that point, um, the misconception of portfolio trading is that you're always going to get the best price possible, and maybe that was true in low volatile, low volatile times. Um, it's the most potentially the most efficient way to trade, but depending on volatility, the makeup of your portfolio, it, it may not be the best price on that given day. So to, to Phil's point, the data analytics, knowing, you know, measuring the the volatility, measuring the probability of execution, um, that's really important, and it doesn't always work if you're trying to get the best price. Yeah, I think a big it's 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 the cost of of putting risk on or taking risk off, right? I mean that's the way we always explained it to our investors at Invesco because I think we were pretty early um, to introduce portfolio trading to non ETF accounts, right? I mean essentially portfolio trading has given has given non ETF managers the ability to move baskets, for lack of a better term, um, quickly and, and and in in a decent sized fashion, which um, was has not always been the case, um, especially during volatile times. Um, you know, Molly once again showed a um, you know talked about on our slides uh, kind of the profitability uh, of portfolio trading over the past couple of years. Um, my concern is that if that if that if that profitability continues to shrink, what's going to be you know sell side firms have donated or, or, or committed a lot of resources to these desks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if, if, if that profitability shrinks, do we see the desks start to pull back a little bit? Just, just as if you would see capital pulled back um, in, in volatile times to, to more <clears throat> um, riskier asset classes. So, um, you know, my question has always been to um, our experts here, or, you know, our guys that are focused on it here at Invesco from a trading standpoint, uh, who've created systems internally and things like that, is this a bull market trade? That That's always my first devil's advocate question to people when we speak to them. And, and I, I know it's going to continue to exist, but do we will we continue to see the abundant liquidity as, as, as markets start to pull back? I mean, if we can pull back anymore. Yeah, that's a great point, Tom. Really, what you, I mean, if I translate right, you're saying you're 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 willing to pay for good uh, liquidity, particularly in oh, portfolio yeah. trades. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the hardest thing working remotely, right? Even even when we were in the office and you're working for a portfolio manager in Atlanta or um, you know in different locations around the country, what is their what is their level of anxiousness to get this trade on? Mm -hmm. And then as traders, knowing the portfolio manager's level of anxiety and also looking at the markets. When we first started <clears> trading <throat> portfolios, we basically had one gentleman doing it in every asset class. Well, we we rolled out an internal system. Now our emerging markets trader can go in and do a portfolio trade and knowing the cost to move that risk and knowing what's going on in the emerging markets uh, you know, on that day that gives him better feedback, right? So um, it's all about the, the cost of, of moving the risk around. That's great. Um, so speaking of bull and bear markets, we did get one good uh, audience question. Um, we had to touch on the 800 pound gorilla in the room, um, which is the Fed in this case, not the SEC. Um, we'll save that till later. <laughs> so the question, um, how much does the Fed's monetary policy affect the time horizon of the electronification of credit markets? Liquidity has been so cheap for so long, and now it appears that the Fed will not fold and backstop the market should we see another drawdown. So big question. So what impact does the Fed have on market liquidity and electronification in general? Anybody uh, brave enough to take a stab at that? Look, I, I'm gonna, from a sell side uh, perspective or, you know, kind of an alternative liquidity provider, 
you know, I think this is going to be very driven by how what the client demand is to continue to use electronic trading, right? I think those needs, um, you know, if they continue to increase, you know, sell side providers have to be conscious of the economics for providing, right? No, it, it, people need to um, to feel confident that there is an opportunity to make some some money in providing liquidity, right? Whether it's electronic, whether it's voice. Um, so as the Fed um, changes their their policies, you know, to, will we see widening credit bid offer spreads? You know, sometimes that creates opportunities to trade electronically. I remember in 2009, it was great trading electronically because markets were wide and you could trade well inside the bid offer. Um, but we're in a different regime with technology, right? There's more tools available for the buy side and the sell side to share information, to aggregate. Um, so I think it's going to be contingent on how the buy side needs to adapt their um their offerings to their, you know, whether it's institutional or retail clients. Um, so, you know, there's this paradigm where the sell side is trying to push certain agendas and the buy side's trying to push certain agendas and they, and they meet in the middle. Uh, and I think that that's what we're, we're going to see here. But if you, um, it, it's very hard to unwind processes that have been integrated into workflows. Um, it's the same as changing human behavior, right? It's, um, humans are going to do what they are most comfortable uh, doing and, and where they have the highest level of confidence. Uh, and right now, electronic trading has, it has grown. So will it tick down a little bit? Potentially. Um, but could it easily go up in investment grade to 50% over the next few years? That's a, that's a, real, uh, that's a real possibility. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And it seems like a, a lot of the e trading growth has come from um, not necessarily growth of existing protocols, but addition of new protocols that tend to work like portfolio trading. Um, and sorry, sorry, Eric, go ahead. You yeah, know, I was just going to add like increasing volatility. You know, we've spoken to many, you know, we talk about systematic credit, and a lot of these are non traditional accounts, credit accounts, and they typically trade equities, and they're like, you know, needs more volatility, more, more price movement. You know, maybe maybe this does bring more entrance into the marketplace who are used to trading more electronically, who know about fixed connectivity, um, know how to make prices and leave orders and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that could further electronify the market even more. I mean, it could it could definitely dampen some of the folks who are traditional voice uh, who don't embrace all different protocols. But I think they could get left behind uh, with newer entrants who are really going to master kind of these uh, future protocols and and the connectivity play. Um, Tom, we got one specifically for you. How have dealers been able to add sales value to you and your team um, as the markets have gotten more electronic? Yeah, it's it's been a, it's been a bit of a struggle. Um, you know, we have younger traders on our team. We have an old man on our team who you know is right here. Um, <laughs> but so so we work in different fashions, right? I mean, we we try and have. Um, co-coverages at the larger firms and and, and it, it, it's been a bit of a struggle I, I mean I um, and I probably struggle with it the most because that's that's my preference in, in getting um, getting that color out of the respective um, sales desks and um, yeah it's not it's not been easy it, it, it's not uh, but you know I, I, we try and get that point across that that different people like to be covered in different fashions and they look for different pieces of information um so it's it starts with some hand holding and then can potentially lead to some more difficult conversations but uh you know when the volumes follow those respective uh good sales calls that has a tendency to wake people up a little bit right and to phil's point whether it's electronification uh or it's voice um fed or no fed if if, if the desks can can be profitable Based on our inquiry, um, and 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 our that potential profitability lies in better communication on on what's going on on a broader scale. Um, it has a tendency to uh, to improve. I guess is the nicest way to put it. Great. So so there are a few more questions, um, but we are just about out of time. We'll try to get to those maybe offline. But I wanted to end with the, the what's next for electronification. Um, Molly put up that chart sort of showing E across a variety of asset classes. But if we focused on fixed income, 
I think uh, Tom already mentioned loans, but uh, CLOs, munis, swaps, um, where do we feel like automation is coming next? And maybe the other side to that question is where is it needed the most? Um, again, we're all crystal ball here, so we won't hold you to it, but what do you see coming? I was worried you were going to put me on the record for giving you a percentage for that chart for uh, 2025. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that after. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, look, it's exciting to see what's happening in the loan space. The loan space, uh, Octora is, is, is a recent, um, is a new new platform uh, focused on loan and CLOs. So, you know, two markets certainly ripe for disruption. Um, we're excited to see kind of that take off. And uh, look, I think on the loan side, Specifically, frankly, we thought about the bond and ETS space. There's been a lot of investment for many of the dealers, buy side and sell side, frankly, um, who are investing, who invested a lot in that space. And now they're with a lot of investing in the loan area. I think there's going to be some growing pains, but I think that's a necessary evil to get to the point where we can electronic that market. So great that there is some new activity happening in space. Uh, I think it will take a bit longer, but excited to see what the potential is. Um, other areas, like I said, I think the, the protocols across bonds and ETFs, uh, even though we've done a lot of work the last decade in, in terms of like, it's so easy to find out what dealers are axing right now. Like, as Tom mentioned, you can find it in any system you want. You know, how do those protocols evolve? Um, if you do manage a sense of risk book, and I can talk like equities, like, will there be the ability to leave an order, a low touch order, a high touch order, and have that more electronify? I think those are areas that are. That, will, that are kind of the next the next stage in the, in the bond electronification effort. Yeah, Kevin, um, there's a lot of parts of the market where um, we don't transact in from a principal or or a uh, or a liquidity provider perspective. Um, you know, could the muni market see some innovation? Right? I, you know, there's been these legacy ATS venues that have been used by the financial advisor community heavily. Um, it, what is there, a million muni QCIPs, right? So yep. when you think about fragmentation, it, there could be an opportunity there. Um, but to Eric's point, a lot of these innovations take time. It's not just like the field of dreams, right? They, you build it and everybody shows up to play ball on day one, and that's um, that's the job of the, of the, the venues. Um, and to, to really help advocate for their value proposition. So th there will be innovations that come to market. Um, and a lot of it might be on EMS platforms that allow for um, better analytics and, and workflows as opposed to um, every fixed income asset class is going to become highly electronically traded um, in the next you know, two years. That's, it, it's going to take some, some work for you know, the back ends need to feed into all the liquidity providers, uh, their systems, as well as the buy side in, you know, somewhat similar fashions for it to actually work. And I think that that's why, where credit has had the success and rates is very electronic, right? And FX is, is, is you know, even more electronic and, and much more of a speed game. Um, so we'll see. There'll be probably, you know, continued fragmentation around kind of the electronification of fixed income for the next few years. Great. All right. Well, with that, we're just on time. So thank you all for uh, for your time this morning, for your candor, fascinating conversation. Um, and then, yeah, Paulina, I'll hand it to you to, to take us out. Well, thank you so much, guys. This was great. You guys were awesome. Uh, for all the attendees, there's going to be a recording available, and we'll also be sharing some uh, highlights of the conversation. If there are any other questions that we haven't answered, please just come back to us via email. You know where to find us. Thank you all so much. This was great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Have a great day.